Oops. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Good morning. The Cherub Choir is here today. I am so excited. The Green Lake Singers are here today. That's amazing. And let me just look. I don't see her in here yet. We have somebody here all the way from Chile. Oh, there you are. Daisy Pinchera is with us today. Welcome, Daisy. We're so excited you're here. And if your family is watching on the live stream, hi, Pincheras. We miss you guys. All the best to you. All right. Let's look at some announcements, if we can, in our bulletin. Next week, we have La Chante Claire with us. They will be bringing great music reminding us of a heritage of oppression and hope. And um, there, there's a more detail in your bulletin. I hope you read about that. They will be with us for Sabbath school and again with us for the church service. So next Sabbath, make sure you're here for that. All right, let's see. Pastor Hans, why don't you talk to us about movie night? You want me to look? I could do that. Have you, oh, happy Sabbath, everyone. Yes. The 22nd, thank you, Doc, will be our um, another family movie night. So please come and watch some movie with us. Last time was, was good. It was good. We watched Aquila and the Bee. This next one we will be watching... Sound of Music. I cannot forget that because the little ones will destroy me. So the Sound of Music at 6 p.m. on the 22nd of February. Thank you. And after you come for movie night and get all comfortable and relaxed on Saturday night, on Sunday, February 23, we're going to the snow. So come and get cold and wet with us. Wait a minute. No, you're going to wear appropriate Northwest gear and you're going to be comfortable. I was out riding my bike last night and Karin had said, oh, don't go riding your bike. It's storming. It's raining. And I said, but you bought me this really cool rain suit for Christmas. I mean, it'd be like, you know, if you give your kid rubber boots, are they supposed to stay out of puddles? So I put on my shiny yellow rain suit and went riding in the storm. It was wonderful. So February 23, let's go to the snow together. Details in your bulletin there. May 23 is International Sabbath. So read the announcements. Start thinking about how you can be part of that. Uh, we need your help. And last, we have announcement again this week because... One item was missing last week. We have a new baby among us. Let me see if I can remember how to say his name. Hendrix Theophilus Grindel. And as is our custom, we have a flower here in honor of the new baby. We do like babies in this church. So to all of you young families, stay busy and we will welcome your children. I invite you to stay and greet one another, pass God's peace here in God's house.
I'll invite you to find your seats. Let's open our hearts as the choir calls us into worship. Let's pray. Creator of earth and sky and sea, thank you for calling us to this place and receiving us with your smile. Lord of the seasons, thank you for the darkness of winter and the promise of spring. And we pray that you will work in our own hearts to bring new life every day. Lord of the nations, hasten the day when swords are turned into plowshares and spears are turned into pruning hooks and justice rolls down like the great river. Lord of our hearts, work in us and through us, mold us and shape us that in the week to come we may be partners with you, accomplishing justice and peace. Here's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering today is for Adventist TV Ministries. Our seven-day Adventist television ministries here at home and across the world are making a huge impact and promoting the gospel to millions of viewers. With your help, commitment, and sacrificial giving, we can continue to provide these modern age services. Um, let's commit a portion of our income to these ministries. Will the deacons please, please stand? <clears throat> 
Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for always being a loving Father and always providing for each and every one of us. Now, Lord, please take this offering, bless, and use it to thy will and thy service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, each of you, big kids and little kids. My story today is about someone I knew very, very well. I'm almost 75, so I knew her for almost 75 years. And that person was my mother who died almost a year ago Easter. And the topic today that Pastor John is going to share with us is about a very well-known person in the Bible, Daniel. And I thought, oh, what a wonderful story to tell the children about a modern-day Daniel. And my mother was such a prayer warrior that most of her day, 24-7, in her mind, she was praying. She was so close to God that as the topic and the title of the sermon today is Holy Defiance, that was my mother. She was very holy and defiant. Many of you who knew her, the children not so much, but Greg has a couple pictures of her when you might have remembered her when she was every week here in church. One picture is when she turned 97, and the other picture is when she turned 100. But she lived to be 102 and a quarter. And as you kids probably say sometimes, no, I'm not six, I'm six and a half. Mother would definitely say, I'm 102 and a quarter. She lived a full life, and we three children, my brother and sister and I, welcomed her into God's arms when she died the 4th of April of last year. And we are looking forward to seeing her and dad on the great resurrection morning. One of the things that she did during her prayer time was there are many children in the family, probably not as many as some of you are aware of as far as relatives are concerned, but she had quite a few grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and they lived mainly on the East Coast and in California. And since she didn't get to see them very often, whenever she did, she would have them draw their hand on a piece of paper. And each time they came, they would be a little bit bigger, and she would have them draw another picture of their hands, and she would put them in her journal that she wrote in most every day. And when she would have her prayer time, she would place her hand over each of the children individually, their handprint, and would pray specifically for that one child. And every grandchild and child and great-grandchild remembers Grandma praying for them in their good times and in their bad times. And when... We had a memorial service here at Easter time in the church and buried her in Seattle in Washelli to be by dad until God comes and raises both of them again. My niece wrote a poem about our dear grandma's hands. And I will only read a couple of the lines about her praying for each of the children. We always knew, even though miles apart, that with countless prayers, she held our heart. By laying her hand on ours, she did trace. Oh, her amazing love, blessing, and grace. And I will always and daily remember my dear mother, And am so thrilled that she is now at rest in God's arms, and I will see her very soon. Remember, Jesus loves each of us. He loves whether we're little or tiny or tall or old or young. He is our best friend.
Thank you. You may pick up your blue buckets. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing each and every one of us here today to worship you in this holy place. We thank you, Lord, for being with us not only throughout this week as we went about our daily activities, but for being with us throughout our entire lives. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you give to us each and every day, all the clothes we have, the food we eat, and the homes that we live in. Thank you for being a loving Father and always providing for us. I also pray, Lord, that you be with all those that are sick and not able to be here with us, Lord. I pray that you put your healing hands upon them and let them know that you are there. Also be with those that are lost and those that do not know you. Help them to know that you are always there through the good times and the bad. And help us, Lord, to be of service to those that we encounter every day by showing them a glimpse of your love, whether it be through our actions or our words, even though at times it may seem hard. I thank you, Lord, for loving us unconditionally and showing us what true love really is. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Old Testament reading is from Daniel 6, verse 6 through 10. 
The administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement with administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of the lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down, as usual, in his upstairs room, with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He, paid, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Bear with us, she's a little shy. Then the captain and his men 
went out and brought the apostles back. But the soldiers and did not use force because they were afraid that the people would kill them with stones. The soldiers brought the apostles to the meeting and made them stand before the Jewish leaders. The high priest questioned them. He said, we gave you strict orders not to go on teaching in that name. But look what you have done. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. You are trying to make us responsible responsible for this man's death. Peter and the other apostles answered, we must obey God, not men. You will, you killed Jesus. You hung him on a cross, but God, the same God, our ancestors, has raised Jesus up from death. Jesus is the one whom God raised to be on his right side. God made Jesus our leader and savior. God did this so that the people of Israel could change their hearts and lives and have their sins forgiven. We saw all these things happen the Holy Spirit also proves that these things are true. God has given the Spirit to all who obey Him. May the Lord bless the hearing of the word. Sometimes the right answer is no. I won't. I remember fairly early in the ministerial career, the church had a program called In Gathering. And we would go out and collect money for the poor, sick, and needy. That's what we thought we were doing. We did, well, we collected money for the poor, sick, and needy. But the money was not spent for the poor, sick, and needy. The church was using it for other things. Um, as this became known, people began to protest, say, hey, wait a minute, you've know, you got to tell the truth if you... If you're raising money for disaster relief, you've got to spend the money for disaster relief. If you want to raise money to put a roof on the church, then raise money to put a roof on the church. But don't mix them up. And I, being a young hothead, you know, when you're young, you have principles, right? You expect adults to be consistent, to do what they say. So, I remember the way the Adventist Church is organized. You have congregations, and then the next layer of organization within, within the denomination is called the conference. So, the guy at the conference who was in charge of ingathering called me into his office because we were not raising our money. And he says, John, you know, I know you guys can do this. I mean, I, you, you've got the ability. And, uh, you know, and the church, I need you to do this. I said, oh, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from because, I mean, you and I are friends. Um, but 
But there's a guy above you who's keeping track of you and saying, hey, how are you coming with your goal? And then there's a guy above him who's keeping track of whether he's raising their goal. And so you're just doing your part to, to be faithful in the system. And he had a big smile on his face. He, yeah, you get it. I mean, it's not personal, but, you know, we've got to do this thing. I said, I'm glad we had this conversation. Um, but just so you know, my congregation won't know that we have talked. I said, because there's pressure from up there to there to there to your desk. And then it's your job to send the pressure to me. And it's my job to send that pressure on to my people. But I won't. Sometimes you just got to say no. Long, long time ago, there was this guy named Daniel. Kids, he was old. By the time we tell this story, he was, oh, he was even older than I am. I mean, that's how old he was. He was old. But he was really, really good at what he did. A new king had come. They had knocked off the old king. A new king came. Daniel was so good at what he did that they said, <clears throat> Daniel, we need you to help us out run the kingdom. So the king organized the whole realm into 120 provinces. And then over the provinces, there were these three people. Daniel and two others. And they were supposed to run things so that the king could take it easy. And Daniel was really, really good at his job. It says he was faithful, he was competent, reliable. And it wasn't long before the king goes, you know, I got three guys here. I really only need one. Daniel, uh, I think I'm going to put you in charge of everything. And then you can have three guys under you. And you've got all the headaches and I can take it easy because you are so trustworthy. That's how good Daniel was. He was so good that the other people started getting jealous. And they thought, man, what can we do to get rid of this guy? Well, they could not find a thing. When it came to financial records, his were absolutely perfect. When it came to personnel decisions, he was absolutely impartial and fair. In every area, his work was flawless. So finally they said, I don't know, if we're going to get him... We're going to have to make up something. And then they thought, ah, we'll get him with religion. You know, he's got that weird Jewish religion. I'm sure there's something in there that we don't like. And then they realized, you know, hey, in their religion, they're only supposed, you know, they're really big on this anti-idolatry thing. We'll get him with that. So they went to the king. King, you are the greatest absolutely the greatest. You're the best we've ever had. In fact, you're so great. Why don't we make a law that for the next month everybody has to pray to you. So at the temples, instead of naming a god, they will name you. And everybody for a month will have to revere you as God on earth actually is the doorway to heaven. What do you think, king? Isn't that a good idea? And the king goes, sure, why not? Be careful when people kiss up to you too much. It's probably, there's probably something going on, but it sounded okay to him, so all right, here goes. So they passed the law. 
and they get all the stamps on it and all the signatures on it, and it is now the immutable law of the land. And then they, the people who didn't like Daniel, they ran over to his house. Because one thing about Daniel is he was a man of habit. He was consistent. You knew what he would do. Because he'll probably do the same thing today he did yesterday and last week. And sure enough, they saw him open his window and kneel down and pray toward Jerusalem. They quickly got a few more people. They got plenty of witnesses to see Daniel's praying just like he always does. This was not some new thing Daniel came up with. His life had been characterized by an awareness of God, a respect for God, an attunement to God that was rooted in his prayer life. So they ran into the king and said, ah, King, we're really sorry to, I mean, it breaks our heart to tell you this, but you know, Daniel, I mean, he's, he's so good in so many areas, but apparently he does not respect you. Uh, you know, we're, we're sorry, but he's over here praying to, praying to somebody else. And the king suddenly realizes he's been had. <laughs> oh, he's mad. But the law was the law, and you got to do what the law said. And he spent all day trying to find a legal loophole, but he couldn't find a legal loophole. And finally, you know, about sundown, the people come in and go, King, um, you know, the law is the law, and we got, you know, the officers are ready to go arrest Daniel, and we just need your signature on the arrest warrant. And, um, oh, man. So the king signs it. And he says to Daniel, um, hope God protects you, man. I hope your prayer works. I did all I could, but I can't save you. So they threw Daniel in the lion's den, sealed it up. The king went home, but he did not go to sleep. He was miserable all night long. Ah, oh, I can't believe I let myself be suckered into this. You know, he, he, can you imagine if you were the king, how you'd be feeling right now? What an idiot. What an idiot I was. How could I have not seen this coming? Pride goes before a fall. In the morning, as soon, as soon as the sun peeked over the horizon, the king is at the lion's den. He has him open it up and he calls out, Daniel, are you still in one piece? Was God able to save you? And Daniel says, ah, don't worry. I had a good sleep last night. A lot better than you did. God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth and they have not hurt me. Now, in modern storytelling, we would end the story about there. But older fairy tales in the Bible include a few more details. You know, the, the, the gory details. So the Bible says they pulled Daniel out. And then they got all those people who had been scheming against Daniel and they threw them in. And it was not a pretty sight. In the book of Daniel, the key to virtue over and over again is saying no. Daniel chapter 1, when he was a young man, they offered him food that would have symbolized their acknowledgement of Babylonian gods. They said no. Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar says, you will bow or I will burn you. And the three Hebrews said, we will not. No. And now, Daniel says, no. No. I will not pray that direction. I'm going to pray that direction, honoring my God. 
It is common for us in Christian circles to imagine that obedience is the highest virtue. Classic uh, devotional. You know, my utmost for his highest. Presents absolute, unquestioning, unhesitating obedience as the highest virtue. And there is wisdom in obedience. But unquestioning, unhesitating obedience is dangerous. And the book of Daniel clearly shows us that defiance, guided by wisdom and righteous principle, that defiance is absolutely essential to the righteous life. In 1890, a guy named Homer Plessy walked into the train station in Louisiana, bought a first-class ticket on the train from New Orleans to Covington. He got on the train, sat down, and it was pretty comfortable. Now, as you might imagine, in Louisiana in 1890, they had segregated trains. There were cars for white people and cars for people who were not white. Mr. Plessy was sitting in the white car. Nobody questioned him. They had sold him the ticket. It was fine. Until the conductor came in. And the conductor came in and said, Mr. Plessy, are you colored? Mr. Plessy said, yes, I am. Then you must go to the other car. No, I won't. Then I'm going to have to have you arrested. Yes, you will. So the conductor called a private detective. And the detective came in and arrested him for violating the Louisiana train law and turned him over to local police. It was actually a very carefully planned act of defiance. Mr. Plessy could easily have, if he had just wanted a train ride, he looked white. He was, in the language of the time, seven-eighths white. <laughs> and the conductor would have never asked him if he was colored, except the conductor was part of the plot. And the detective was also part of the plot. They made sure that he was arrested for violating the train law because if somebody had known that he was legally black, they could have charged him with all kinds of other misdemeanors. But they wanted to set up a test case for the U.S. Supreme Court. The local judge upheld the law. The Louisiana Supreme Court upheld the law. And then it went on to the Supreme Court. Now we need to a little historical background here. In the world that Plessy had grown up in, in New Orleans at that time, in the 70s, 1870s, early 1880s, it was It was a town where blacks had a large amount of freedom. The differences between black and white were easily blurred. There were lots of people of mixed blood. There were people who had been slaves before and people who had been free before the Civil War. There were the Creoles that had come from Haiti with French backgrounds and African backgrounds. It was a multicultural city and getting along pretty good, thank you. And then in the 1880s, white supremacist movements began gaining strength. And then in late 1880s or 1890, they passed this law that said, okay, no more black people on the white train. And Mr. Plessy was part of the local, oh, Pastor Hans has been coaching me. Let's see if I can say it. Comité de Citillon. 
Citizens Committee. <laughs> and he volunteered to get himself arrested so they could challenge the law. It was a golden opportunity for us as a country to stand up against this white supremacist stuff that was sweeping the South and actually other places as well. Oregon and Washington were very much developing the same trajectory. And when they had first, when they had first made their plans in 1890, the Supreme Court makeup was such that probably the law would have been struck down. But by 1896, or yeah, I think it was 1896, it had become they had replaced it with some conservative justices. And when it came to the Supreme Court, they said, no, separate but equal is fine with us. And for the next 58 years, America was haunted by this notion that we can put blacks over there and we'll say it's equal and we're all good. Only one Supreme Court justice stood up and said no. We needed more. In Louisiana on the Supreme Court, somebody could have stood up, well, it would take more than one, and say no. Justice requires people standing up and saying no. In 1956, Rosa Parks got on the bus December 1, on her way home from work. She sat in the black section of the bus like she was supposed to. But a few stops down, the bus was filling up. The white section got completely filled up. And then there were some people standing in the aisle. And the bus driver stopped and went back. And they had a little sign, you know, blacks behind this sign, whites in front of this sign. He asked the black folks sitting in this row to give up their seats, and he moved the sign back. And Rosa Parks said, I won't. He called the police. She was arrested. On December 5, she went to trial there in Montgomery. And on December 5, the black citizens of Montgomery boycotted the bus system. And the next day, they boycotted the bus system. And the next day, for 381 days, they said, we won't. They broke the bus system. And civil rights attorneys took Mrs. Park's case all the way to the Supreme Court. And finally, after 58 years, with Brown versus Board of Education in the background, they stood up and said, she's right. You can't do that. We appropriately celebrate the heroism of black folks who have stood up and said, my cooperation is finished. And we should honor them. But most of us in this room today are not black. It is absolutely essential that we stand up and say no. Amen. My preferred, I like people. I like to get along with people. I like it when people like me. And that's good unless it goes too far. Most of us want people to like us. That's the way God made us, right? 
I mean, if we didn't, if none of us cared about what other people thought, you know, it'd fall apart. No, God made us as social animals, and we, you know, we, we need to get along and, and be easy with one another. But there are times when we must stand up and say, no, I won't. We won't. Sometimes we have to do that at home. When abuse happens in the home. Somebody has to stand up and say no. Sometimes it happens in the church. The church takes a stand and it's wrong. And you have to stand up and say no. I don't care how many people voted for it. Votes matter. There's a place for social organization within the church. But sometimes committees and councils get it wrong. And we have to stand up and say, no. And it certainly happens in nations as well. The book of Daniel makes it clear that there is a place for God's people in Babylon, in a social, political system that is not holy. That's where we live, and it's okay. God's place for us is in Babylon. We like to imagine that only we're supposed to live in Jerusalem where God's laws are always obeyed, like they ever were. But we can imagine that. You know, wouldn't we like to live in a Christian nation where everybody would do just like Jesus? That ain't never happened. It ain't never going to happen until Jesus comes. But we can dream. It's okay. But the reality is God's people in the book of Daniel live in Babylon by God's design. And so do we. And when you live in Babylon, the only way to be righteous is to be defiant. Guided by wisdom and righteousness and cautioned by humility. Remember, we too can be wrong. <laughs> dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. And hopefully, we will stand together and say, no. No.
Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and through you. May the Lord give you peace and make us instruments of his peace. Amen.